Hey, my name is Gavin. I'm one of the pastors. It is good to be together and to uh, learn from God's word on this cold, wintry morning. If someone could please tell old man Winter that we ain't ready for him yet. He did not get the memo, and yet here we are. So on a completely unrelated note, I have sensed a call from the Lord to maybe plant City Light Scottsdale. (laughs) So I'm just, stick with me here. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe uh, a few of us could just go down maybe for the month of February on a vision trip. Jonathan would just see if the Lord, if there's a work for us to do, you know, we'll give it a month. And if it's no, it's no. If, If it is, yes, then here we come. Uh, but in the meantime, here we are. So I'm only kidding, mostly kidding, but kind of, anyway, as the Lord leads. Hey, uh, uh, grab your Bibles and uh, head to Genesis chapter 40. This is our third week studying the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis in a series that we have called Pit Stops of Providence. In the first week, if you'll recall, we met a 17-year-old Joseph. He was dreaming wild dreams before he was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers to some Ishmaelites on their way to, to Egypt. And we found Joseph in his first pit stop, a pit stop of betrayal and, and, and abandonment. Last week, we met uh, Joseph a little bit later in life. He had uh, risen to the position of overseer in his master Potiphar's house. Potiphar had put him in charge of all that he had. And Potiphar was a pretty uh, big, important dude. He was the captain of the Pharaoh's guard. So to be the steward over everything that he had was a high honor. But as we learn, when Joseph refused the advances of Potiphar's wife, she accused him of assaulting her. And he found himself in jail for a crime he did not do. And there, last week, we met Joseph in his second pit stop of providence, the pit stop of being unjustly punished for doing the right thing. And this morning, we find ourselves in chapter 40, and here is Joseph in our story. He's about age 28 now. So 11 years have passed since he left his homeland, was sold into slavery, but it doesn't appear that he's any closer to brighter days. We find Joseph still in jail. He is living out the unknown duration of his sentence. So there he sits, one day blending endlessly and uh, undistinctly into the next day, time passing him by. The years of his youth wasting away, the years of his life wasting away, no certain future, not sure if he has anything left to look forward to, just tick talk, tick, talk, time, passing him by. Now in this chapter, nothing seems to materially progress for Joseph. Actually, it almost reads like like an intermission in his story, a chronological placeholder in Joseph's life. He seems to be stuck in neutral. He's not moving forward. He's not progressing in any positive direction. That's where we find Joseph in chapter 40. If I'm honest, this is one of the things that I find kind of challenging or difficult about reading or preaching through uh, books of the Bible and longer stories like this is figuring out what part of the story belongs in one sermon and what part of the story belongs in another sermon. I don't know if you uh, notice in your Bible, it doesn't tell you where to start and stop preaching and I have a Bible no different than your own. So you need to kind of look at the narrative arcs, you need to look at the themes, you need to figure out what is one sermon's worth of text. Specific to our study of Joseph in uh, in Genesis, it seems to me like chapter 40 would have possibly fit better with 41. 41 is where all the action picks up. You know, chapter 41 is where Joseph actually gets in front of Pharaoh. 41 is where this dream interpreting skill that we read about today actually gets him somewhere. It gets him deliverance. It gets him his elevation to leadership. It gets him to a measure of prosperity, and it gets him to the salvation of his family. Like if this whole Joseph story were made into a movie, chapter 40 that we're looking at would only be the setup. It would be the lead into the real action that culminates in chapter 41. In chapter 41, well, that would be the beginning of a happy ending. Chapter 41 is where the soundtrack behind the action would would, would, would shift keys from a minor key into a major key. And chapter 41 is where all these loose ends and, and random pieces start to make sense and get tied together. If a, if a movie were only made into a, a chapter 40 of Joseph's story, no one would go and watch it because there is no resolution. There is no happy ending. It just sort of 
ends where it started. The story is not complete in 40. There's no bow on the narrative arc. There is no happily ever after. It's just time passing by. Some seemingly insignificant events unfolding, and yet another round of disappointment in Joseph's life and story that leaves him right where he started. And so as a preacher, it's tempting to want to go a little faster through this section, to sort of tie together chapter 40 and chapter 41 so that I get to tell the whole story this morning, so that there aren't so that we aren't left longing for the resolution and the major key change and the happy ending of the sermon that will actually come in chapter 41. But upon further review, if you think about it, and if we're honest with ourselves, isn't it true that chapter 40 on its own is maybe a better picture of the majority of the days of our lives? Always a little short of complete, a little unfinished, a little unresolved, just a little bit stuck. I'm curious, by a show of hands, those of you who do own a home, how many of you have completed 100% of your home renovation projects and you are just living in the final product that you had always dreamed you would be in? If you're anything like me, you can replace all the outlets and light switches on a Saturday afternoon during the duration of one football game, but it will take you nine more months, maybe a year, to put the plate covers on. You know, the ones that cost 39 cents and take all of 15 seconds to replace? I have a shocking ability to not uh, take a project over the finish line. Just ask my wife. How many of you parents have successfully completed your kids' discipleship? You've had every conversation that needs to be had. You've equipped them in every area of life uh, to go and engage the world as a fully equipped disciple of Jesus. How many of you have resolved every relational conflict you've ever walked through? You've made amends with every person who's ever hurt you, and you have your relationship house perfectly in order. Isn't it true that we live most of our lives in chapter 40? Somewhere short of the finish line of completion, feeling a little bit stuck, feeling a little unresolved, feeling a little bit in neutral. For example, how many of you, again, when you were younger, thought you would be a little bit further than you are right now in life? Maybe you thought you'd be married by now. You thought you'd be done with school by now. You thought you would own a home by now. You thought maybe you'd have more saved up by now. You thought you would have more of life figured out by now. You thought you would have outgrown those plaguing insecurities by now. But so much of our lives feels like we're stuck in a long intermission, stuck somewhere short of where we think we should be. At this point in Joseph's story, we don't know how long he's been in jail, but it's been a minute. We know that because the previous chapter said he has been entrusted with more leadership. He's raised up in the ranks within the jail. He's been there long enough to be put in charge of a few things, which means he's, he's not just getting acquainted with this jail sale. No, he's been there a minute. He'd like to appeal his unjust prison sentence, but in this construct, there is no appellate court. There's no system of appeals. His, his only hope, he would like to get in front of Pharaoh himself, but from where he's at, there is no route to get there. And so for now, what, is, what does Joseph have to do but to sit there, just waiting for what? He doesn't know, just waiting, feeling like his life is wasting away. Tick, talk, tick, talk, time passing him by. If I had to define the third pit stop of providence in Joseph's story in Genesis, I would say it's a pit stop of being stuck, a pit stop of waiting, a pit stop of uncertainty, a pit stop of incompleteness, of delayed deliverance, of not knowing when or if his life will ever move on from this prison cell. But if I had to title a sermon based on Joseph's third pit stop, I would title it this, you're not as stuck as you think you are. God's providential purposes in life's intermissions. Because as we look at Joseph's intermission pit stop, as we look at Joseph's waiting, we're going to see yet again God's providential hand, his invisible hand at work in Joseph's life, at work in the details, at work in the timeline, at work in Joseph's heart, Joseph himself, preparing him yet again for what is in store, even though he can't see it. And so my prayer, church family, for you and for me, as we look at this story, is, is that as we look at Joseph's pit stop of waiting, we would again learn to see and trust God's providential hand in our own lives. 
That if you feel stuck, you're in neutral, you don't know when the sun will dawn, that even in that uncertainty and the waiting and the lingering, you can know, oh, you're not stuck. God is at work right where you're at. We're going to see together from the text that God uses these intermissions in our lives to develop our character, to um, develop our gifting, and to grow our faith and to wait in the Lord's timing. So let's hop in and take a look at it together from the text. Number one, we're going to see that God uses the intermissions of our lives to forge our character. We start in chapter 40, verse 1. It says, Sometime after that, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. Now, it's 11.30 a.m. Some of you hear about Pharaoh's chief cup, bake, uh, cup bear and baker, and you immediately get hungry for Panera bread. Well, these two were more than just preparers of food. These are high-ranking senior officials in Pharaoh's cabinet. They were top leaders within his security detail. See, Egypt is not a democracy. And so you can't just vote an unfavorable pharaoh out of office. No, the pharaoh was there for a lifetime position. So if you wanted pharaoh out of the office, the best way to get it done was to slip a little something into his drink. So the cupbearer and the baker, well, they were among pharaoh's closest and most trusted confidants. They would prepare and oversee a, a team of people that would prepare his food and his drink. They would sample every bit of it to assure uh, the safety of it as they gave it to the pharaoh for his consumption. But verse 51 says that each of them, the cupbearer and the baker, has committed an offense against the pharaoh. We don't know what the offense was, but what we do know from verse 3 is that he put him in prison, but not just any prison. He put him in the very prison where Joseph was also confined. Coincidence, you might ask? Oh, no. You've listened to this series long enough to know that there is no such thing. This is providence, the invisible hand of God that they wind up in this cell. Verse 4, the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. He, he put Joseph in charge of these formerly senior officials in, uh, in Pharaoh's cabinet. That's interesting. If you missed last week, let me remind you of how that chapter ended because it's important to the context of this chapter. At the end of last chapter, uh, Joseph had just gotten into prison, but it said that in, in due time, the keeper of the prison, the guy in charge of the whole operation, put Joseph in charge of all of the prisoners who were in that prison. So even while Joseph himself is a prisoner, he has been entrusted, he is now in charge of the prisoners uh, in all of his sections of the prison. So it also says that Joseph was so good at it that the captain of the, the, the prison, the boss there, he, he didn't even have to pay attention to uh, where the units were where Joseph was in charge. He was so trustworthy. He was so good at it. It was such a gift to this man. And it says that the Lord was with Joseph in all that he did. And here in this case, the senior officials have been put in jail, and who is in charge of them but Joseph himself? You know what? That tells me something. You know what that tells me? That tells me that even though Joseph had every reason to feel sorry for himself, even though he had every reason to pout, even though he had every reason to be angry with the woman who falsely accused him, to be angry at Potiphar for his imprisonment, it tells me that Joseph did not play the victim. He did not take on a victim mentality. He took on a servant's mentality. And just like he served faithfully when he was living large in Potiphar's penthouse, he serves faithfully when he's at the bottom of the prison pit. He's the same person from the penthouse to the prison. That's called integrity. And just like before when he was in the penthouse, now in the prison his character and his relationship with God are noticed by the people around him. He stands out. And because of this, he is entrusted with more responsibility and more opportunity starts to come his way, even within prison. Now, some of you can see where this is headed. So if I can pause for just a second and perhaps press in a word of application, I think we all have something to learn from Joseph here. We've all been wronged by people. We've all gotten a raw deal. 
And this morning, I want to say, if you're stuck, if you have been wronged, if you have been unjustly fired, laid off from work, you're stuck in neutral in life, and you feel like this is quite literally someone else's fault. I didn't put myself in this position. Number one, let me say, I'm sorry that happened. Injustice is not okay. Jesus longs to hear you and to heal your heart and to take you down a path of forgiveness. But also hear me say this, the best way to prolong a season of being stuck is to wallow in pity, withhold forgiveness, harbor bitterness, and embrace the identity of a victim. That's an option for you, but it's also the surefire way or surefire way to stay stuck and not move forward in your own life. But Joseph shows us another way. We see no bitterness in this man, no victim mentality. He leans into his relationship with God even though the hands he was dealt were very difficult. He rolls up his sleeves and he says, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to serve others. And as his character is formed, responsibility and opportunity start coming his way. And he starts developing this level of servant leadership that God is going to use in an amazing season right down the road for Joseph. Furthermore, as he heals from his own wounds and grows in his character, He starts to develop an eye to really see people around him. Look at verse 5. It says, And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, get this, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? So get this, Joseph's in a position of leadership. He's got plenty of responsibility on his plate. But verse 6 says that after these two inmates had a troubling dream, he said he could tell something was off. He saw that they were downcast. And verse 7 says that he asked them, uh, hey, uh, why are your faces downcast today? In modern language, it would be like saying, hey, bro, I can tell something's off. What's, What's got you down? Everything Okay. Joseph could have, in this moment, been licking his own wounds. He could have been feeling sorry for himself. Instead, God has given him an eye to see people around him, to see their struggles and their needs and their wounds and their hurts. And he actually steps in to ask about their lives, and he extends help to them. And isn't it true, friends, that in our own lives, as we experience our own hurt, God will use those moments to open our eyes to To look around and go, oh my goodness, you too, you too, I can see it now. Until I was dealt the blow, I didn't see it, but now I can see it. And my own pain, I've been, my eyes have been open to the pain of others. If I could just brag on my wife for a moment, she's not here so I can do that. Uh, She's amazing. This week was hard for her. There's just some, some health issues going on on her side of the family and kind of grim, and they had her sad and down all week for good reason. Many tears in my home uh, this week, just one of those weeks. And so uh, Thursday, I came home from work, and Sarah's making a giant pot of potato soup. And I said, wow, cooking for an army, you know. (laughs) There's a whole Husker team coming over today, and uh, just trying to make her laugh or smile. She said, well, I called our old neighbors. We used to have these, this elderly couple that lived next to us. And he had a stroke a few years ago. She takes care of him. She, I could just tell over the phone. She's feeling down. She's feeling depressed. I need a reason to go check in and make sure they're doing okay and just sit down. So I'm making them dinner so I can take it over to them. Right in the midst of her own painful week, her own tears, she saw her old neighbor. So I need to go serve this woman because I could see the pain in her. Yes, Joseph is in a difficult place. Yes, he has every reason to feel sad, frustrated, and down about his own situation. But God is growing his eyes to see others, to also see their needs and their hurts, and to step in as a leader. Isn't that what God does in our intermissions? Why am I stuck here? What is he doing in my life right now? Well, God will use the intermissions of our lives to forge our character. Second, God uses the intermissions of our lives to develop our gifting. Let's uh, jump back in the text uh, where we left off in verse 8. It says, they said to him, those are the baker and the um, cupbearer, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? 
please tell them to me. Okay, that verse, verse 8, is key to this whole passage here. Joseph says two things. He says, number one, do not interpretations belong to God. He's recognized the author. He said, tell them to me. He's got some sort of confidence that he's able to help them out in this moment. Now, notice with me, if you remember the story, this is a different Joseph than the one that we met two weeks ago in chapter 7. Something has happened in Joseph in this pit stop. Because in chapter 37, Joseph also encountered two dreams. They were two dreams of his own. But number one, he made no connection back to God. And number two, he had no way of interpreting them at all. And so in that chapter, he uses these two dreams very poorly, flaunting them over his brothers. And it causes a heap of mess and gets him into a lot of trouble. But now something has changed in Joseph. Somewhere along the way of these pit stops, Joseph has cultivated a relationship with God. And from that relationship with God, he's developed a talent that is given to him from God, the ability to interpret these dreams. This is new. Watch how it unfolds. Verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me. And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, it bl- its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well for you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so to get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, Hey, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the utmost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. <laughs> I'll bet the baker wish he hadn't asked. You know, that was a good interpretation. Hey, I got one too. I got one too. I shouldn't have asked. What we're about to see in our last verses of chapter 40 is that these interpretations are spot on. They're accurate. Joseph can now accurately interpret dreams. God has refined in him a gift, a talent, a skill somewhere along the way of this pit stop. He's developed his character, and now he's honed a skill, a skill that chapter 41 is going to tell us leads not only to his own deliverance, but the salvation of a family and a nation and the continuation of God's covenant people because of this skill that's been honed in this season. That's what 41 tells us. But can I remind you once again this week that 28-year-old Joseph in chapter 40 has not read chapter 41. He has no way of knowing how this beautiful story is going to unfold. He has no way of knowing that in just two years, God is going to give Pharaoh a dream, and his name is going to get called, and God is going to use this exact skill learned in what felt like a prolonged intermission when he was stuck in life that he developed in this season, that that skill, he didn't even understand why he had the power to do it, was going to be the key variable for his salvation the rest of the story. All that Joseph knows is that here's two men that have had a dream. He's got compassion on them. God has grown his skill, his ability to interpret those dreams, and Joseph is is growing in his courage to use that gift of the interpretation to tell the truth. Whether that truth is good news, like in the case of the cupbearer, or it is troubling news, like in the case of a baker. And isn't it true of our lives? The skills that we have, our opportunities to contribute in the best way, those, those skills were almost never developed in the spotlight, on the platform, when we were ready to, to give our best to save the day. Oh, no, no, no. Isn't it true that usually those skills are developed in the mundane, unseen, unsexy seasons of our lives? I get the joy of serving as a a chaplain for my local volunteer fire department. It's a great honor to serve these selfless first responders. They donate all their time. They put their life and they put themselves in in harm's way to serve other people. And 
I got to say, it's amazing to watch them at the scene of an accident. The, the tools that they have, they can use their jaws of life and cut a, you know, a little sedan in half in a matter of moments. It's amazing to watch them run into a fire, saving lives and property. They work as a team without even really having to communicate, just working together in unity. But those moments really only happen, honestly, a few times a year. What's not usually seen or appreciated is the weekly, mundane, mandatory training that they do week in and week out. Often it's the same drills over and over and over. It's another Thursday night away from dinner with their families for drill night. It's another Saturday morning for mandatory work day at the station. Rinse, repeat, rinse, and repeat. Weeks can go by. And it looks like these men and women are wasting their time, stuck in neutral, spinning their wheels, doing the same thing over and over like a long, boring intermission. But it's in those unseen and seemingly unheroic moments that their skills are being developed to be the hero when the call comes and it's their time. God uses the intermissions of our lives to develop our gifting. You might be familiar with another uh, man in the Old Testament. His name was Moses. Moses was called by God to liberate his people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land, but a young, ambitious Moses jumped the gun a little bit on his calling. And as a young man still in Egypt, as a, as a prince of Egypt, as a matter of fact, he, he killed an Egyptian for beating a Hebrew slave. And because of that, he had to go on the run. He was a fugitive on the run outside of Egypt, and for 40 years, 4-0, 40 years, God kept him in a holding pattern as a fugitive. He spent all of his days and nights shepherding sheep of his father-in-law's flock in the wilderness north of Egypt. For 40 years, he is chasing sheep in the desert. Talk about feeling like you're in timeout in life. Talk about sitting in limbo. Talk about an intermission. Talk about feeling stuck. He must have thought there was no purpose in the waiting and the wandering leading sheep around the wilderness, just learning where the watering holes were to get the sheep to water in the desert, learning what threats were there so that he could keep them safe in the wilderness, learning how to build and move portable housing in the wilderness for 40 years. What a waste of time. What, what possible use of service in the kingdom of God could come from such skilly, silly skills like keeping sheep alive in the desert for 40 years? All of a sudden you smile because you know your Bibles. Isn't it funny how God works? How he uses the intermissions of our lives. How even though we go, we think to ourselves, none of this makes any sense why I am here and I am stuck and I am not moving forward. And yet for the next 40 years, God would use Moses to shepherd his most prized possession, his beloved people through that very same desert. Using every skill he learned from his 40-year master class in desert survival and wandering. City Light, listen to me. There is no wasted waiting. God's providential hand has a purpose in all of it. And if you're stuck, if you are in the pit stop of a prolonged intermission in life, just know that God uses those intermissions to forge your character and to grow your gifting. Number three, Last one, stick with me. God uses the intermissions of our lives to grow our faith. Now, at this point in the story, you might be thinking, hey, things are going to move along to the next chapter of Joseph's life. I mean, his character has matured. His gifting has developed. It's like, put him in, coach. He's ready for the game. The season of waiting is over. He's no longer a selfish 17-year-old. He's a servant-hearted leader at 28. But just like our lives, it doesn't work quite that linear. Verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the, of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbaker to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker and Joseph, uh, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Mm. Imagine Joseph's anticipation before verse 23 hits the page. 
He's had the opportunity to minister to the very right-hand man of Pharaoh himself. He's got an inside advocate who has an ear, has the ear of the king. He attended to this man's need. He interpreted his dream. The only thing he asked the cupbearer is that he would remember him when he regained his freedom. He's never been closer to deliverance. His hopes are high. Surely, after all these years, this will be his moment. But a day goes by, and another day goes by. And a day goes by, and he probably thinks to himself, you know what, don't freak out. These things take time. You know, he's working up the chain of command, and a week goes by, and a month goes by. Another month goes by, and a quarter of the year goes by, and the weather starts to turn chilly again. And Joseph's high hopes of deliverance slowly start to crumble. A year goes by. 18 months go by. 20 months go by. And now it appears that absolutely nothing has changed from verse 1 of chapter 40. Tick, tock. Tick, tock. The sound of time once again passing Joseph by. His life wasting away. He is stuck in neutral, going no place. Verse 23 says the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. This is interesting. That word remember is a key word repeated all throughout the book of Genesis. It's a loaded word. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1 tells us that God remembered Noah and he made the wind to blow over the earth and the water subsided. Chapter 19 verse 29 says that after Sodom was destroyed, God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot from the destruction. Chapter 30, verse 22, says that God remembered Rachel and he opened her womb. Our passage says that the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. But what you and I know is that while the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, God has remembered Joseph. Spoiler alert, plug your ears if you don't want to know where the story is going. You're going to get to it next week. But the very next verse of the very next chapter tells us that in just two years, God is going to give Pharaoh a dream and suddenly Joseph will be remembered. And he'll finally be delivered from his imprisonment. He will ascend to the rank of the second most powerful man in all of, Jesus, or of, all of Egypt. But for now, Joseph has no way of knowing that. Instead, get this, what he can't see by sight, he's going to have to learn to believe with faith. That even in the waiting, even in life's intermissions, even though he doesn't even know if chapter 41 is coming, he needs to believe that God has not abandoned him, but God has remembered him. And even though his circumstances are grim, that God is still good. He'll need to believe that by faith. Corrie Ten Boom lived in Denmark during World War II. She and her family helped many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust. And acting on information from an informant, the Nazis, the Nazis arrested the entire Ten Boom family and sent them to prison. While in prison, Corrie had to watch her younger sister, Betsy, starve to death. Listen to what Corrie wrote about this experience in her book, The Hiding Place. She wrote, often I have heard people say, how good God is. We prayed that it would not rain for our church picnic and look at the lovely weather. Yes, God is good when he sends good weather. But God was also good when he allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my very eyes in a German concentration camp. I remember one occasion when I was very discouraged there. Everything around us was dark and there was darkness in my heart. I remember telling Betsy that I thought God had forgotten us. No, Corey, said Betsy, he has not forgotten us. Remember his word, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. There's an ocean of God's love available. There's plenty for everyone, Corey concludes. May God grant you never to doubt that victorious love, whatever the circumstances. Isn't that powerful? God is still good even when our circumstances are not. Pit stops of providence. City Light, our God is so good. He is so good to us that even when life seems to be at a standstill, even when we feel stuck, even when our circumstances are grim, God is still at work for his glory and for our good. 
How can we know? How can a slowly dying Betsy Ten Boom be so sure of this that even though her life is slipping away, that her God is still good? How did she know that he had not forgotten her, that his steadfast love was still for her? Well, she knew it because he had already proved it at the cross of Christ, where Jesus came and he died for her sins and died for your sins and died for my sins. And so she knew in her waiting that listen, whether chapter 41 of her life ever shows up or not, whether she's delivered from her jail cell just like Joseph or if she dies her last day in prison, that the very next moment after her final moment in this life would be in the presence of Jesus himself in the life to come. City Light, this morning, if you find yourself in a pit stop of providence, of waiting, of being in between, of being stuck, know that God has not forgotten you. God sees you. God loves you. God is at work in your story. Intimately, he is refining your character. He is developing your gifts, and he is growing your faith to believe that he is good, even when your circumstances are not. To remember the good news of this gospel this morning, we're going to take communion. Communion is the meal that Jesus left us to remind us that no matter our circumstances, he is still good, and his love never fails us. The communion servers are going to be in the back, and they're going to be in the front as they grab the elements right now. Let me just remind us of what Scripture says about this holy meal. It says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup and he gave it to them saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you take the bread and the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The circumstances were very grim on the cross, but Jesus knew my father is still good. As he waited for his final breath, he knew this is not a waste of time. This is God's perfect plan being accomplished. He will redeem even this moment of waiting for his glory and for my good. And we know the rest of the story on Easter. He got up out of that grave. Our sins forgiven, our eternal life secure, and we will be with him in glory. This meal is to remember that. And so this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to the Lord's table. No matter your uh, traditional or church denominational background, we ask that you are a follower of Jesus, however, that you have repented of your sins that you have trusted in the Lord Jesus as Savior, as Lord, and that you come forward humbly recognizing the uh, gravity and significance of what this meal represents. I want to encourage you, the word communion means to commune, to be with Jesus. We don't only commune in the bread and the cup, but it's a time of communion. You can commune in prayer as well. And so don't, don't rush forward, uh, but pray. If you're in a journey of in-between, consider how it is that God wants to shape and form and forge your character. What are the skills he's trying to grow in you? How is he stretching your faith? Thank him for those graces. And then come forward and be reminded uh, of of the happy ending that 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 moment will bring. There's also a prayer team in the back that's eager to pray with you. And so, man, don't be shy. If there's anything in in, in your life that this has surfaced, uh, go back and pray. Maybe you'd love to trust Christ for the first time. Maybe you're in a season of the in-between and you're just praying, Lord, would you bring chapter 41 a little sooner? (laughs) I'm ready for it to come. I'm happy to wait if you got me here, but if it could come Monday, it's okay to just ask the Lord. Go back and and pray with someone. If you need physical healing, pray for a loved one, whatever it is, just a time of of, uh, ministry and prayer in the back. Let me pray, and then you come forward whenever you're ready. Oh, Jesus, you are so, so good to us. God, we're so thankful that we can trust you even when uh, we feel a little bit stuck. We're not quite where we think we need to be, where we ought to be. We've fallen short. We're not sure what tomorrow brings. We're awaiting someone else's decision. We're just there, God, that that your hand, your timeline, your purposes are perfect, and we can trust in your providence. You've proven that on the cross, where you've died for our sins and risen to give us new life. I pray that you would minister to people where they're at this morning. Your spirit can see into their circumstances and their heart and minister far better than my words ever could. And so we invite you uh, to minister to all of us in prayer and worship and at the table now. In Jesus' name, amen.